My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been my of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he had promised our ancestors. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Thank you for joining us in our second week of Advent. As was just mentioned, this is the week of the wonder of peace. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Angela, and I'm one of the pastors here at the table. Uh, Fun fact about the words that I just read to you, those words were at one point banned by three governments. First was when the British ruled India. You weren't allowed to say it outside, out loud. The second, more recently, was in Guatemala, Uh, the Guatemalan government was so afraid that the poor people would hear those words and rise up that they banned them from being stated. And also in Argentina, under military rule, you could say it inside, but you can never speak those words outside. But for most Protestant Christians, I bet it's kind of hard for us to place those words and their origin and their voice. And if you can place those words, I have a feeling it could be because you see them through the lens of a saint, not through a person, not through a poor teenager. So today on the second week of Advent, we're going to explore the wonder of peace and we're going to do it through the eyes of the one who spoke those words, the one who is called blessed among women, Mary, mother of Jesus. Now we have Mary, mother of God, Saint Mary, Virgin Mary, Mama Mary, Hail Mary, right? So many ways to describe one person. But yet I grew up thinking about her only at Christmas time. And that's mainly because she had a key role in my nativity set. We glaze over her because we don't know what to do with her. (laughs) I, for one, am much more comfortable talking to people about the, the wonders of healing I see in Scripture, more so than the wonder of a virgin birth. Uh, And if you want to discredit Christianity, that's usually the first stop. Oh, your Jesus was born to a virgin? Sure he was. It's easy. So most Protestant Christians pull her out at this time of year for her place in the stable and then tuck her back in the box until next year with little more than maybe a, hey, thanks for giving birth to Jesus. We'll see you next Christmas. Right? At least that's my experience. But not this year. Because before there was the incarnate Jesus walking the earth, there was Mary. And not Mary, the beautifully dressed and adorned saint we often see, but Mary, the human, just like you and me. And as Becky mentioned last week, so much of religious art focused on removing the human from Jesus and Mary and made them these untouchables up here. And that really was a disservice to all of us. Because Mary was human. And based on scripture, we have no reason to believe she was sinless at all. We also have no reason to believe she remained a virgin because 25 clearly states, and these words are strategic, that they didn't have sex up until this point, right? So how did so many either elevate her to an unreachable pedestal or just completely disregard her life out of one act? I, like I said, we just didn't know what to do with her. She was a poor young woman who birthed the Son of God, and it can be hard for us to give credit to women now for their work. (laughs) Imagine back then, right? Uh, During a time when it was commonplace to stone women, especially for having a baby out of wedlock. It terrifies us to think of Mary as a regular person, because when we do, we that we are called to have the exact same kind of faith. Mary is not to be worshipped. 
but she is also not to be forgotten. She is to be admired, and her example is to be followed. And out of all the people in the world, everyone, everyone in the world, she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. That's got to mean something. So let's take a look at why that was and how her peace helped usher in ours. But before we do that, because the devil was in the sound system this morning, we are going to pray. Lord, we thank you for this space. We give it to you. I know you're here with us. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, uh, you just sink into the hearts of everyone here. I pray that everyone's hearts are open to receive whatever you have waiting for them, Lord, and I know it's good. Uh, Protect this space as we are here tonight, Lord, and go with us as we leave. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So when we look at Scripture, we actually learn uh, about Mary way before we meet Mary. Isaiah 7.14 talks about the virgin mother, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us, right? Right? It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. In that same book of Isaiah, this Emmanuel is referred to as the Savior, right, of his people. It says that a virgin, without the cooperation of a man, would give birth to a child who would be God with us. And even in the New Testament, if we fast forward, Paul, one of the founders of our church, he stated that God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. People of the day knew Mary. They knew of what she did. They knew the importance of it. And we generally pick up her story in Luke, but her story is also in Matthew. Both of those uh, gospel chapters explain, uh, books explain uh, the birth of Jesus in detail. But we associate Luke with Mary because Luke really focuses on Mary's point of view of the story. So that's why people often speak of Luke with Mary. So, we have Mary. She lives in a small town called Nazareth. And when I say small, I mean like a few hundred people. Uh, She's engaged to a man named Joseph. And she's spending this time, her engagement time, at home, learning how to be a good Jewish wife and hopefully preparing to be a good Jewish Jewish mother. And this this town, Nazareth, is is really special because it's not special at all. Fast forward, you hear Jesus, and they're saying, oh, what good, good, what good could come from Nazareth? Because absolutely nothing came from Nazareth. Bad didn't come from Nazareth either. Just no good came from Nazareth, right? Nothing came from that town, except everything. And it bordered on two areas that were not full of Jewish people. They were full of Gentiles. And so those are the people, those are the untouchables of the time before Jesus, right? They were not the chosen ones. And the idea that Jesus came to a town, to a place that bordered on these areas that were full of Gentile people, it illustrates what his heart was planning to do for these people, it illustrates where his heart was going. It was going out. It wasn't looking in. And so it's very significant that Mary is from Nazareth, even though Nazareth is not significant at all. And we pick up the story in Luke chapter 1. Now, you all can read along with me, but if you have a good imagination, I prefer that so that you can get some imagery in your head. Um, And Luke chapter 1 doesn't exactly start with Mary. It starts with uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin, and she and Zechariah are both old. They're old people. They've been married a long time. They've always wanted a child. Elizabeth has been told her entire life that she cannot have children. And then an angel, Gabriel, the same angel that visits Mary, visits Zechariah when he's in the temple, and he says, guess what? Elizabeth's pregnant. You're going to have a baby. Zechariah does not believe him. Gabriel gets really upset about this, and he mutes him. He makes him mute until John is born. And John, then Jesus' I guess, second cousin, uh, ends up being the one who will prepare the way. Right? He's the one that comes right before Jesus to start the ministry before Jesus walks in. So it's very significant that, angel, that the angel Gabriel also came to Zechariah and Sarah. So we pick up the story right after Zechariah's been muted uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. This is when we learn about Mary. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. 
The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary responds with, How can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel said, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And Mary closes with, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then Gabriel left. So Mary's now full of excitement, doesn't really know what to do with all of this. So she leaves her house and runs to Elizabeth's house. And it's 80 miles, so running was only a part of it, I'm sure. But she got there somehow, okay? And she shows up at Elizabeth's house. And at that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to the town, uh, the hill country town of Judea, where she entered Zechariah and Elizabeth's home. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped and was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's John. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And soon, as the, and as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she, that's Mary. And Mary, of course, now very excited because she's got this full confirmation about what just happened. She responds, full heart, with those words, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he had promised our ancestors. Now, after that, Mary left, and she went back to Nazareth. She stayed with Elizabeth until John was born, because it says that she stayed with Elizabeth a few more months. So we can assume that she stayed there, John was born, she left. She goes back to Nazareth, and at that time, the first Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus, issues a decree that he wants to take a census of everybody. And so everyone needs to go back to where they were from. And because Mary and Joseph are descendants of David, they have to go back to Bethlehem. So they take another 80-mile journey. She's very pregnant at this point. Uh, An 80-mile journey all the way back to Bethlehem to be a part of the census. And while she's in Bethlehem, she gives birth to Jesus. And this is where a nativity scene pops up, right? There's no room at the inn, so Jesus has to be born in a trough. And then the shepherds appear. And the story of the shepherds is actually quite sweet because Mary and Joseph were alone They traveled there by themselves. And then God, even in our most alone moments, brings these these crusaders of comfort, right? And they show up just just an ooh and awe at this baby. And that's the first time we see those famous words that Mary is known for, that she stores stuff in her heart. She took all of that energy from the shepherds and put it into her heart. And I think it was mother's intuition because she probably had a feeling that life was about to get messy. And she wanted to be able to pull from those words and those moments later on. So she stored it in her heart. And then much later, the wise men show up. So I'm really sorry to ruin your nativity. The wise men were not present at the birth of Jesus. They came about almost almost a year later, right? So they show up. And because they show up, Herod, who at the time was the ruler of Judea, a smaller city-state, right? Um, He knows scripture too. 
And Micah points to the idea that the king of the Jews would be born in Bethlehem. And this makes Herod really, really nervous. And so when he hears the report that the wise men have found this baby in Bethlehem, he's panicked, and he wants to kill him. So Mary and Joseph are visited again and told, hey, you've got to get out of here. Leave now. Flee to Egypt. You're going to stay there until I tell you it's time to return. You can't come back until Herod is dead. And so they do. They obey. In the middle of the night, they get up and go. And then they come back after Herod is back that way, and they want to go to Judea. But they find out that Herod's son is not the ruler, and they're like, can't do that. Bad idea. That's not wise. So instead, they go to Nazareth. So that's how we get our Jesus of Nazareth, born to Mary of Nazareth. And some of you are thinking, duh, Angela, I've heard this story my entire life. You've told me nothing new. And that's fine. But, but, there's a few things that I think we look over when we tell this story to ourselves and when we just think about this time of the year in general. Like the fact that when Gabriel visited Mary, At that time, God hadn't spoken in 400 years. Imagine that. They haven't seen God do one thing in generation, 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 generation. All these people are telling their kids and their grandkids and their great-grandkids about all these prophecies that they're just hoping at one point will come true. And they're keeping the faith for that and continuing to learn scripture. 400 years and then he shows up like this. And also the idea of him showing up like this. Angel visitations are not common throughout Scripture. They're very common in this story because the story is incredibly special. But they are not. Gabriel shows up four times in Scripture, and two of them are in this chapter of Luke. So even the idea of being visited by Mary's words, depending on what version you read, she is perplexed or frightened by the greeting, by what he is saying to her, not by the fact that Gabriel is there. Did Mary have visits from Gabriel or other angels before? She, wasn't, she didn't fall on the ground and have a heart attack like I would have if an angel showed up and told me those things, right? She was confused by the greeting. What kind of greeting could this be? Not, hey, there's an angel in my room. And again, Nazareth is small, a few hundred people. It's just another illustration that it doesn't matter where you come or how much you have for God to use you. You have found favor with God, Mary. And when I pray for favor, it's usually because I already know the outcome and I'm just hoping it happens. Right? That's not what this is. Mary was told she was favored by God twice in this greeting. And then after that, her life got significantly worse. You are highly favored. God's favor (laughs) means something other than what we think. And another fun fact, this, what I just read to you, Mary's song, is the longest set of words spoken by a woman in the New Testament. And I grew up never reciting them, never learning from them. And after she finds out she has a baby, she has to tell her family. Her husband, her fiancé, did not believe her. An angel needed to tell Joseph, hey, this is real for him to believe. And then he came back and said, okay, it's cool. I checked it out. And that when she gave birth, she was in that stable in Bethlehem. And right across the way, there was a man-made mountain King Herod loved to build things. He built more within the empire at that time than any other ruler. And he built himself this palace. At the time, it was the largest palace in the Roman Empire, and it was directly across. Lit, I'm sure. As she gives birth in a trough, she stares at that. The man who would eventually come for the head of her child. And the Part of the story doesn't even include her hardships with Jesus when he was older, like when she had to watch her son be murdered. 
is plagued by chaos right after she is told she is highly favored. And as a, I think we often, and I can only speak for myself, uh, in the past I read this story about a virgin birth, and I don't think my, my whole mind thought this, but I think in the pit of my stomach, I like to think about this as just a nice folktale, a nice story that we're told. And I realize, though, that type of mindset, um, those, that mindset of disregarding this very specific part of the story, uh, makes me wonder that if we disregard this, I wonder if we're lacking in miracles in our own life. When we start to look at our relationship with God from a plausible lens, we start to create our own version of God, right? Um, where it's impossible for us to see how impossible he is, right? So for that reason alone, I choose to believe in the virgin birth because I believe in an impossible God. A brave teenage refugee virgin birth. So she hears what's about to happen from Gabriel, knows a lot of uncertainties ahead of her, and yet her mouth and her life respond immediately with praise. That's what this is. This is a hymn of praise. This is the oldest Advent hymn. My teenage self would have responded differently. What's in Mary's song and what's not in Mary's song tells us everything we need to know about her. Because aside from the obvious difference of me not bearing the incarnate Jesus, teenage Mary also had something else that I didn't have. Peace. There's not a mention of it in her song. I don't know why. Mary didn't have to pray for peace because she already owned it. She knew God's word. She knew God's character. She knew God. So she knew peace. She didn't need to understand to follow. Mary was just told she would birth the Savior of the world, and yet not one of her prayer, part of her prayer for her journey is peace. When you know you already own peace, you don't have to pray for it. You just have to pursue it. And as you pursue it in yourself, it spills out to others, just as we talked about with those Advent candles. Her peace was greater than her understanding. This is what Scripture means when it states that the Lord's peace is greater than our own understanding. And reading about Mary encourages us to revisit our own thoughts on peace. Like, for instance... What is peace? Our colloquial definition of peace literally describes the freedom from something. And honestly, I think that just illustrates how far we have come from God <laughs> because real peace, Mary kind of peace, is not the freedom from something. It's the freedom in something, right? We often search for what we think is peace because I think it's really hard for us to acknowledge that God is in the everything. We forget that he knows the number of hairs on our head. We forget that we were knit in the womb by design, not happenstance. When we lose our connection to God, we lose our peace. And then we're left with just escapism, not peace. We legitimately let our peace go and replace it with escapism, something that will never sustain us for longer than the experience. And if you're wondering whether you've done this in your own life, think of the last time you were under pressure and when life didn't go as planned, where did your heart go? And if you know me, I probably asked you about your heart and how it's doing uh, because that's where the peace of God lives and where everything flows out. Saying guard your heart is just another way of saying guard your peace. So when we let our peace go, we are constantly on mission to find it in something else or someone else. And when we confuse escapism for peace, we may not want to admit this, but we know as soon as the vacation is over, as soon as that person leaves your bed, heck, as soon as those mind-numbing hours of television are over, or as soon as whatever you just imagined in your head is over, so is our peace. And we are on the hunt for the peace high all over again. What is masquerading as peace for you? I don't know what it is, but I know it exists. The world has told us that things outside of us will bring us peace, so we keep going, buying, and generally consuming. And it's not that these things are in themselves bad, but they are not peace. And until we realize this, this cycle will continue and will be left empty every time, not only empty, but also scared. 
Real peace isn't a place where we go, it's the place that we live. And if our peace is a destination instead of a dwelling, we do not have peace. Mary's story also reminds us of the importance of keeping our peace, right? Real peace is probably the one thing, right? We can just keep it to ourselves, but we give it away to people who are not only interested in taking it, but have no interest in actually having it for themselves. They just want, they'll discard it too as soon as you give it to them. They'll go on to the next one. They just want to take it. They don't care actually about having it, but we give it away freely because we have forgotten what it's worth. We let it be grabbed from us. If we look at Mary's song, at the center of it is, is God. The of her words, it's about her mighty king. It's about God, the God of Israel, the Holy One, the one who abounds in love and mercy, about all the promises that he has kept for his people. Her peace is centered on God because the world can rob us of absolutely everything but our peace. But it's often the first thing that we give away freely because we forget what it's worth. And if you're not driving with a Mary story, that's fine. Um, I'm not offended, but she might be. And some think she is a saint with power, so watch out. Um, But there's another story of somebody who was really good at keeping his peace. And his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was a theologian. He was a pastor. He was a revolutionary. And the Gestapo in concentration camp Germany did not like him. And he was arrested for refusing to obey them. And in 1943, he was hanged. And he knew he was going to (laughs) die. And on his way out of his cell, he says to his cellmate, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. He knew peace until the very end. He didn't even allow death to rob him of his peace. We allow so much less. And Mary didn't let anything rob her of her peace. Dwelling with God is the only way you look at every bit of the chaos of life and keep going. So who are you allowing to rob you of your peace? And why? Remember, this world will bring you trouble. The world will bring you Herods and financial issues and job issues and relationship issues. But what, everyone? Take heart. We already know the one who has overcome the world. Take heart. The way to keep your peace is to make sure it is centered on God and not you. And the last thing to revisit is the idea of owning our peace. Mary owned her peace, for sure. No one was going to take that. Those words were so deep in her. And once we realize that God's peace is for us and accept that, we can stop focusing so much on asking for peace and instead get to the work of being the peacemakers we are called to be. Collectively, Christians probably pray more for peace with the decisions they've already made without God than discernment in what decision to make with God. We pray for peace outside of us all the time. Peace in our world, peace in our decisions. Peace isn't out there, right? We feel peace out there, but peace starts with us. The ripple effect, the wave, that happens after it flows out of us. It originates with you. That God ordained nothing can touch me kind of peace is not static, and it was never meant to be. Because when we abide with God, that peace flows out of us into others so that others may know that escapism is a cheap imposter for real peace and that something so much better is waiting. And it's not something we have to ask for. Peace is owned. The peacemaker, if we ever thought about this, did not make world peace when he arrived because we've always thought about this wrong. The peace he was coming to make is in our hearts. This is the battleground. Everything else is secondary. And you know how you do this? 
You pray and you learn scripture just like Mary did so that when someone comes for your peace, instead of handing it over to them, your response can remind you that the Lord is your helper and you should not fear what man can do to you, that your Father knows the things that you need before you ask, that even though you pass through the waters, he will be there, through the rivers, you'll walk through fire and not get burned. Those are the things that your heart can respond with instead of, here you go. How is it that this simple girl from Nazareth was able to do this, right? When other people, much more qualified than her, could not. Because she knew what real peace was. Pray over Mary's song. (laughs) Pray that your soul will magnify the Lord and that your spirit will exalt in God your Savior. So in this season of celebrating our Prince of Peace, the best thing that we can do to glorify the birth of Jesus Accept the peace he came to give us and store it in your hearts and guard it with your life so that when anyone comes to snatch it, just like they tried with Jesus, they don't stand a chance. And then that peace from God moves from you to others. Know your peace, keep your peace, own your peace. And Mary, whatever happened to her, the end of all of this, she sees her son be crucified. It's the end for many people, of this Jesus idea. And instead of going off by herself and mourning, she, she goes with the disciples. She goes with the disciples to the upper room. And in that room is where the Holy Spirit comes upon everyone. She is there. She is with them. She is in it. Scripture gives us no indication that she had prophetic understanding. None whatsoever. Her peace is her understanding. She didn't know how God would save the world. She just knew that he would. What an incredible woman she was. And the essence of this season, in closing, uh, which we usher in our Prince of Peace, as just a quick side note, I want to take a moment to thank all of you and this church Uh, for helping me in my own understanding and acceptance of God's peace. I showed up here five years ago, told myself and probably anyone who would listen that this was my last chance at church in D.C. I was done. I showed up not really knowing. I knew God, but like, really? Um, In my deepest part of my heart, right? Because I was not okay. And I showed up here. So as another year now many years into the table I am, (laughs) comes to a close. I want you all to know that having the opportunity to come up here and preach and share God's love with you is one of the greatest joys of my life. So thank you, Table Church, for allowing me to do that. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all the lessons (laughs) You've given us through scripture. We thank you for all the mighty people who have come before us, people just like us, Lord. I pray that they inspire us to rise up and to do great things in your name. Let Mary's words sink into us so deep, just as she stored things in her heart, Lord. Let us store her words in ours so that we know how to respond when our peace is attacked, when someone comes to rob us. They can't. We trust you with that, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.